So I'm starting a brand new series today. I'm very excited about it. It's called Lies We Believe. And uh, I want to start just by saying that we all believe lies. I'm going to tell you right up front, look me close up and personal here. I'm just telling you there are lies that you believe about God, about yourself, about others. And uh, it, it is Satan's tactic. He's used it for thousands of years and he continues to use it in the culture that you and I live today. So we're going to talk about some of those lies that are sown deep inside of us. And uh, we're not going to get to every lie, but I hope that we're going to start the ball rolling. And maybe what you can do is that you can ask the Spirit of God to reveal any lie that you might believe might be believing right now. So with that in mind, let's uh, start with prayer. And uh, we'll just get going on this particular lie that we're going to start with today. So Father, I thank you for everyone watching. I thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity, God, to be together today even though we are physically not together we have the opportunity god to gather and lord to to remember you and to challenge ourselves in the faith god and and to grow closer and to stretch ourselves so god i pray that all of those things would happen god i pray that that today that you would remove the blindness from our eyes because lies are hard for us to see and oftentimes because they're just deception itself that we don't see that we're being deceived so god i pray in the name of Jesus, that you would send your spirit to each one of us, including me, and allow me to see the lies that I believe. And I pray specifically, God, that you would give me the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God, to really speak the truth here today, to do it in a loving, kind way, and Lord, to do it in a way that draws your people together and to you. And I pray these things in Jesus' holy and powerful name. Amen. So the lie that we're going to start with, this was going to be our opening weekend, but because of uh, some circumstances, we just couldn't make that happen. So the reality is, is this was going to be our open, opening weekend. So I was going to start with this, a grand lie on our opening weekend, and I still believe it's a grand lie, but now you're just going to be watching it at home. So the lie that I hear all the time, I hear it, I hear it everywhere I go, is uh, I have my truth and you have your truth. And I just wanted that, that, you know, that culturally, that's just how people talk today. Well, this is my truth. That's how it comes out. And, uh, and I just want you to understand that if you believe that you have an exclusive market on your truth, then you might be believing a lie. So we're going to unpack that today. And uh, I want to start with a question. And that question is simply this. If you can have your truth and I can have my truth, would my truth that your truth is untrue be true? I mean, you got to, come on now. You got you to deal with that. So we have a skill at retelling our slant on the truth. Have you ever noticed? I mean, when you just look at when there's an accident and there's three witnesses and how everybody has a different take on the accident because we see things from our filter, from our experience, from what's going on in our day that day. It, you know, so the reality is, is that we are great at slanted truth. So let me kind of unpack that for you a little bit. I want to tell you a story. It comes out of American history, and uh, this is a true story, and it's about a guy by the name of Ramus Starr. He was a criminal. He was uh, lacking in character. He was hanged for a horse stealing and train robbery in Montana in 1889. So the only known photograph of Ramus shows him standing on the gallows on the back uh, and, and there's this picture of him there and there's this inscription on the back and this is what it says Ramus Starr, a uh, horse thief sent to Montana Territorial Prison in 1885 escaped in 1887 robbed the Montana Flyers six times caught by the Pinkerton detectives convicted and hanged in 1889 so his family cropped this picture this was the only known picture of him they cropped this picture so that all that you could see was the headshot and the accompanying biographical sketch was as follows here's how they rewrote history Ramus Starr was a famous cowboy in the Montana territory his business empire grew to include acquisition of valuable horses assets and intimate dealings with the Montana Railroad Beginning in 1885, he devoted several years to his life to service at a governmental facility and finally taking leave to resume his dealings with the railroad. 
In 1887, he was a key player in a vital investigation run by the renowned Pinkerton Detective Agency. In 1889, Ramus passed away during an important civic function held in his honor when the platform upon which he was standing collapsed. Now, there is a vast difference between those two stories, and I'm just going to tell you that kind of captures where we are sometimes. We have our truth, and other people have their truth. And so I'm going to talk about what Jesus said about truth, and then we're going to talk about what you, your truth, and then we're going to talk about God's truth. And hopefully when we all walk out of here together, we'll be resolved in our heart to stop talking about my truth and start talking about God's truth. So what did Jesus have to say about truth? So I'm going to read you a passage, a lengthy passage. It's not on the screens. So you're going to have to lean in and follow what I'm saying. And then I'm going to put a scripture right at the end on the screen. So just listen to my words. And this is John chapter 17. This is the famous section of scripture where Jesus now is he's modeling a prayer for the church. This is Jesus praying for you and me. He says, but now I come to you, he's coming to the Father, and these things I speak in the world so that they may, they may have my joy made full in themselves. Stop there. Jesus is saying that I gave them the word, Father, so that they could have joy. That's what he's saying. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And here comes this next famous section of scripture. And this is so important for you and I to hear with hearts that don't have blindness on us. It says, sanctify them. That is set them apart in the truth. Notice it doesn't say a truth. It says the truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So listen to this. To say that you are living in your truth is to say that you are the source of truth. Let me say that one more time to you because that is so important for you to hear. To say that you are living in your truth is to say that you are the source of truth. And what I want to suggest to you is that God is the only source of truth. So with that in mind, let's take a step backwards and let me talk about what I know about you. See, I, I've been doing research about you. I've been following you around. Some people think that when I preach messages that I've been listening to their voicemail. And uh, I, you know, maybe so, but th that's a different story altogether. But there's some things that I know about you that I think are extremely important for you to know about you. First of all, this is what I know about you, that you, were, you are created. Even if you do not believe that, that in God... Here's what you have to concede, that you have, you have to acknowledge that you have nothing, you've had nothing to do with your existence. You are a passive person in the process. You are the product. If you don't believe in God, I believe that I'm a creation of God. I was formed in my mother's womb. That's what the Bible tells me. But if you don't believe in God, you are the product of a nice dinner and a bottle of wine, to say the least. That's your origin. You had nothing to do with it. And therefore, because you are not the source of your life, everything you know, listen to this carefully, don't miss this, everything you know, you have learned. You don't know one thing that you have not learned because you are not the source of truth. So you could have had good teachers, bad teachers. You could have bad life experience, good life experience. You could have a skewed view or a non-skewed view. But here's the reality. The truth is about you is that everything that you know, someone schooled you in or something schooled you in those things. You're not the source of knowledge or truth. That's the first thing that I know about you. Do you agree with that? I mean, come on now, that is truth, right? That you, everything that you know, you learn. Second thing that I know about you is that you are broken by your sinful condition. That's what the Bible says, is that you and I were separated from God by our sinful condition. When you and I came to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, it was an amazing thing. The Holy Spirit now resides in me. That's a miracle. He now leads me and teaches me. He's now my teacher and leads me in the path of righteousness. He's the one that does all those things. But the reality is, now listen to this carefully, don't miss this, you're broken still. There's still a part of you that is broken and will be until the day of Jesus. We're in this thing, I know you've probably heard the word sanctification. We're in this 
process right now where Jesus is making me more like him every day, but I've not arrived and you've not arrived. And therefore, listen carefully, therefore we are still tainted in our thinking process by a broken vessel, by being broken in life. So then, then that creates a problem for me because oftentimes where I find myself in trouble is when I tend to disagree with God. Who am I to disagree with God as a broken vessel? That's the second thing that I know of you. The third thing I know about you is that you are only a responder to truth. So let me show you that from the Bible. This is what Jesus said. You can find this in John chapter 8, verse 37. But this is what Jesus says. I came to bring truth to the world. All who love the truth, now watch this next word, recognize that what I say is true. I'm a responder. I'm not the initiator of truth. I'm the responder to truth. So Jesus then is the one who initiates this truth. The fourth thing that I know about you is that you habitually change your mind. <laughs> Isn't that true? Come on now. You used to have a favorite restaurant and now it's not your favorite restaurant or you used to have a favorite car and now it's not your favorite car or you have, used to have a favorite color and now you kind of changed your mind. This is what I know about all of us. We habitually change our minds. And what I knew 23 years ago, I'm not so sure about. And do you see the craziness of to say that you are the source of truth when the fact is, is last week you had a different opinion about things. You are not the source of truth. But God can say that because, because God is the source of truth. So then I want to transition a little bit. This, I talked to you about what I know about you. Now let me talk to you about what I know about God. And then we'll make a conclusion as to whether or not you should be learning from God or not. So here's what I know about God. That God has no source. That he did not come from something. And I'm just going to stop and say time out. I cannot, just telling you, if you're asking me to explain this to your third grader, I'm going to tell you I'm not going to do it. I can't. You do it because I don't. I accept it by faith that God has no beginning and he has no ending. That's how God reveals himself when he comes to you and I, that he is eternal in his being. So do you remember the story of Moses? Remember, God appears to Moses and he says, I want you to deliver these millions of Egyptian slaves. I want you to deliver them out of the, out of the hand of Pharaoh the king and into a promised land. And uh, Moses is trembling in his shoes. He doesn't know what to do. He is, uh, you know, he's backpedaling with God saying, hey, I'm not a very good speaker. I don't know that I could go and talk to Pharaoh. And and uh, so he negotiates with God for his brother Aaron to go with him. You, you, you've probably read the story. If you haven't, go read it. It's, a, it's an amazing story. And uh, I made a TV movie out of it, by the way. You ought to check that out. So, uh, so Moses finally says to God, Moses says, okay, I'll go, but I need to know one thing. When Pharaoh asked me, who's sending me? Who should I say is sending me? And God says to Moses, he says, tell them Yahweh, my name is Yahweh. That's, by the way, that is God's personal name. For those of you that don't know that, God has a personal name. His name is Yahweh. All the other names in scripture are about descriptions of who he is. But Yahweh, Yahweh is his personal name. And so Yahweh is the one that is sending Moses. And Yahweh literally means self-existing. And we translate that into English as I am. I am the self-existing one. And then we come to John chapter 8, verse 58, and we discover this. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 58. And then we fast forward that a little bit. And we find that when Jesus is going to be arrested, the soldiers come and they, Jesus says, who are you searching for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he then says these two words, actually three, but two that are really important. He said, I am he. But in that phrase, I am, when he said, I am, every soldier that was there was blown on their face. They were blown down on their face because this is the name of God. And so what Jesus was saying is, let me identify clearly for you who you are arresting. 
So why can I trust God? Because he is the source of life. He's always existed. The second thing that I know about God and the reason I can trust him is that God has proven himself over and over and over again to me. And so I want to stop and just do a commercial. It's not that God needs to. It, God doesn't need to do, God does not need to prove anything to me or to you. In fact, God could have, <laughs> this is how good God is, God could have on any occasion wiped us all out and we would have deserved it and started over on the planet. I mean, that's what God could have done. But God is this merciful, amazing, loving, powerful God. And so he didn't do that. And so God has proven his love to us, but he's also proven his word to us. And so there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of scriptures in the Old Testament that point to the first coming of Jesus. All of them fulfilled to the letter and then you just begin to read the Bible as a prophetic book. And I'm telling you, it is amazing. It's powerful how accurate the Bible is in writing history in advance. That's what prophecy is. It's writing history in advance. So God has proven himself that his word is faithful, that what he says he's going to do, he's going to do. And he's also proven to us that he loves us deeply. We sin daily. Yet there is this loving response. There's this showing us of this patience that he has towards us. And he always has his hand out welcoming, welcoming, welcoming us back as we stray away. And he never turns his back on us. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 15. Where Jesus tells the story of the shepherd that leaves the 90 and 9. And goes and find the lost one. That's just the nature of who God is. So having said that, God deserves our trust because he's proven himself. Romans 8, 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates, that word shows, God shows, that word is the word for which we would get the word. When, if you were to go to an, you know, I don't know if they even still have this, but that my mother used to sell Tupperware and she used to have these Tupperware parties. And so she would have this party and she would invite her friends and she would demonstrate how good Tupperware was. That's the word here. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, that is while we were still acting out in sin at our worst possible moment, it is amazing what this text says. This, this is present active participles in the Greek text and uh, it, it's an intensified meaning. In other words, while you and I were actually working in our worst moment, that's the moment that Christ died for me. He deserves our trust because he could have given us the penalty for our sins that we deserved, but he stepped, off, he stepped off the bench, walked around the bench, took the price for the penalty of sin, and let us go free. He is trustworthy. I am not the source of truth. God is. Third thing about God is that God is consistent, unlike me. Our friends and family do not always show up consistently throughout the course of our lives, right? I mean, you can attest to that. We all come from the Adams family. We all have weird people in our lives. And the truth is, is that God is always consistent. Our Heavenly Father is always consistent. And you don't have to worry about Jesus being loving one day and unloving the next. He never has a bad day, doesn't get up. If God slept, he would never get up on the wrong side of the bed. And then our Lord Jesus Christ, this is what the Bible says. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of my favorite authors is an author by the name of A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer, he's an old dead guy now, and uh, he has such amazing wisdom in his writings. And this is what he says. He is immutable. Speaking of God, he is immutable, which means that he has never changed and can never change in any smallest measure. To change, he would need to go from better or to worse or from worse to better, he cannot do either. For being perfect, he cannot be become more perfect. And if he were to become less perfect, he would be less than God. I love that. God is not subject to, the, to inconsistency. He's just not inconsistent. The fourth thing about God that I think is just as amazing is God is not limited by time like you and me. Now, what do I mean by that? What I believed 20, when I was 23 is different today than what I, in many ways, than what I believe today. Not, a, not about things like, is Jesus God? I mean, I 
hold, I held to that then when I was 23 and I hold to that today. Is Jesus the Savior? Absolutely. But there's a lot of things about me, about God, about, about others that I have just, I just see myself differently. I see God in a more loving way and I see myself differently. So I have changed over time. And I, I, I just know without any doubt that God, is, he's not subject to time. So God has never changed. I'm sad this year that hot August nights is, is not gonna happen. I'm grieving a little bit. Uh, my wife and I go down every year to watch the cars and it, it's amazing. So we'll be standing there watching the cars go one by one. And uh, this is kind of how it happens as you know, I'll see this really cool car go by and I'll either say to myself or I'll say out loud, man, that is the coolest car in the world. I mean, it, I mean, it's just amazing. Look how decked out it is. And then I'll see the next car and I go, whoops, made a mistake there. That's the coolest car in all the world. Because I see this parade of cars, one car at a time. When God sees the world, he sees the world all in one element. When he sees your life, listen to me carefully. When he sees your life, he's seeing outside of time. This is something we kind of think God is like us, but he's not like us. God sees outside of time. So God sees our beginning, our middle, and our end all together. And he still loves us. That's the amazing thing. And he knows the thoughts that you're thinking right now. And he still loves you and he still loves me. God sees the whole thing all at once. So I can trust him because he is the only source of truth. So having said that, let's just be honest. When you claim that this is your truth, when you use those words, this is my truth, and it doesn't line up with God's truth, you're just arrogant. There is just the truth. There is just the truth. And if it's not the truth, it's not true. There is no such thing as my truth, your truth. It's all God's truth. Everyone has an opinion. So make sure yours is not blinded by the evil one. Everyone has an opinion. Make sure that yours is not blinded by the evil one. So I have a pastor friend by the name of Bill McCready and he used to pastor down in Gardnerville and, and uh, in between churches he used to attend Grace and we got to know each other a little bit and now he pastors a church back in the Midwest and uh, I follow him on Facebook and, and this week he quoted on his Facebook page he quoted Toby Mac and this is what Toby Mac said. He says, be teachable, you might not always be right. Now, let me ask you this. For those of you watching right now, do you agree with that? Be teachable. You might not always be right. I mean, isn't that pretty straightforward? Isn't that what the Bible says? We're supposed to be humble. All of Proverbs, the whole book of Proverbs, 31 chapters are written so that you and I could understand and increase in learning and that we might not always be right. And so God is instructing us and teaching us. Psalm 119 is all about that too. Be teachable that you might not all, that, because you might not always be right. Toby Mac, I, Toby, I love that statement. I agree with that 100%. But somebody then on Bill's Facebook page posted right underneath this. This is his response to Toby Mac's statement, and this is what they said, and I'm not gonna use a name here, this will be an anonymous name, but this captures where America is today and what's broken about the church, so let me just tell you what they said. In response to Toby Mac's statement, he says, that's a terrible stance. And then he says, so all teachers are right. I'm thinking, that's not what Toby said. You're just hijacking this post to proclaim whatever you want to proclaim. That's a terrible stance. So all teachers are, are right. I can think of several verses that specifically say, beware of false teachers. Toby is letting the woke theology override biblical teaching. Bad thing to have happen. And I'm going, are you stinking kidding me? Are you kidding me? Come on. Read what he said. Read what Toby Mac posted. He just simply said what the Bible says, be teachable, have a humble spirit, understand that you don't, you're not God. And if you're not God, then you've got a lot to learn about life. And if you, you know, that's all Toby is saying. And to say that's a terrible stance is what's broken about the church. 
because sometimes we have such blindness in our minds that we're not hearing or listening or responding with the grace of God or with even understanding. And I, as I think about that, I, my heart grieves. And, you know, Bill handled it well, responded to him well. Good job, Bill. You handled it better than I would have. If you're watching this, Bill, you handled it better than I would have because I would have wanted to take the pliers out. Just me, I'm just saying. So I repented of that. And now I'm moving on because I had to teach today. But here's the deal. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says in response to what I've just said. Psalm 86 verse 11 says, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. Teach me means that I have a lot to learn. Right? Amen? Can I hear the amens rippling through the city of Reno? I have a lot to learn. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according, here's that word again, to my truth or to your truth. That I might live according to your truth. God has a truth and my responsibility is to respond to that truth, to live in that truth, to walk in that truth, to believe that truth. And if I don't, if I get so hard hearted, and by the way, for those of you that are Bible scholars out there, one of the marks of the end of the age not that I'm a doomsday preacher, but one of the marks of the end of the age is simply that men and women's hearts will grow cold to one another. It's one of the marks, it's one of the signs that Jesus said. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. So here's what I want us to do throughout the city of Reno and anywhere in Nevada or across the world, if you're listening, I want us to say this verse together. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. I didn't hear any of you talking out there in, you know, in internet land. So you're going to have to speak just a little bit louder because I am a hard of hearing here. So let's say it again. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. That's the mind and the heart of the humble servant of God. That's what we need to be doing. That's the call of the church. So what I want you to do is I want you to, wherever you're at, I want you to stand. We're gonna sing an older song that really captures the idea of our faith in who Christ is. So let's sing together.